All right, I think we'll get started. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Andy Kirka. I'm the Director of Student Involvement for the University. Thanks for joining us tonight on our New Spiders uh, Summer Series about the School of Arts and Sciences. We're joined by some of our finest faculty at the university, um, and I will let them introduce themselves um, throughout this. Um, at the end, we'll take questions, and we'll if you do have a question, feel free, feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You can submit a question at any point, but we'll start to get to them, uh, and we'll answer your questions at the end. So without further ado, we'll get started, and I will turn it over to our Dean of Arts and Sciences, uh, Dr. Jenny Cavanaugh. Hi, everybody. Uh, so excited to be able to have this opportunity to speak with you right now and to um, share some of the information about the School of Arts and Sciences. Um, as you know, we have uh, five schools at the University of Richmond, um, and the School of Arts and Sciences is the largest. It is, we think of it as the heart of the university because we have over 52 majors that you can choose from and uh, nearly 20 interdisciplinary majors that you can also create. Um, so you're gonna have a chance tonight to hear a little bit about uh, all of the different academic options that you have in our uh, wonderful school. So um, all of our, just for a little context, all undergraduates start in the School of Arts and Sciences. And um, we're gonna take you through some of the potential courses and options that you can enjoy uh, once you join us. So uh, my name, as um, Andy said, is Jenny Cavanaugh. I'm the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, and I am joined by four remarkable associate deans who each represent a particular uh, academic division, and I'm gonna let them uh, briefly introduce themselves. Hi, um, I'm Sharon Feldman. I'm Associate Dean for Division One, which is Arts, Languages, and Cultures, and I'm very happy to be here. Welcome, New Spiders. It is a pleasure to be to be here with you today. My name is Dr. Manuela Meyer, and I am the Associate Dean of the Humanities and Social Sciences in the School of Arts and Sciences. And I am also an Associate Professor in the Department of History, and I teach in the Program of Global Studies, as well as Africana Studies. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be talking with you this evening. Uh, I'm Kelly Donald. I'm a chemistry professor here at the University of Richmond and one of the associate deans. And in my case, with special responsibilities for the natural and applied sciences. Wonderful. And is Patricia here? I think she's, she's um, with us in the, in the group. But uh, Patricia Herrera is our associate dean for diversity, equity, inclusivity, and belonging. So um, mostly our associate deans are gonna talk with you today about uh, the different divisions, but just share uh, with you a little bit um, about the school uh, in general. And uh, we are, as I said, the largest school at the University of Richmond. We have 24 different academic departments and 12 interdisciplinary programs. 70% um, of students, approximately 70% of students will have at least one major in the School of Arts and Sciences. Um, and we uh, also, many of your general education courses will be offered through the School of Arts and Sciences. Um, we are uh, a, an academic community where faculty and students work together. They ask profound and evocative questions, tackle complex problems, create breathtaking works of art, and we engage deeply with our communities. So um, a little bit also to know about the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, it is intensely student focused. So what you will experience here is a small student faculty ratio. So your professors will know you, uh, they will know your name, they will spend lots of time working with you, both in your classes. You will probably engage in research with your professors as well. Um, and one thing I can promise you is that you haven't met them yet, but somewhere on this campus, there is a professor who is going to radically change your world. Um, and I am so excited for you that you're going to have that opportunity. Um, as I said before, we have over 52 majors, 49 minors. Uh, there are so many opportunities. And the associate deans today here will talk with you a little bit about the specifics of um, courses and majors and departments in their own divisions. 
So I am going to turn it over now to, um, I think, to Dean Feldman. Who's yes. Going to talk to you about Division One. Hello, um, I'm just going to speak briefly about Division One, which is arts, languages, and cultures, as we said. And so here, students are engaged in all forms of creative in, in expression in um, all languages. Um, and I was going to go over with you in the next slide, um, the list of departments and interdisciplinary programs. Um, we have a department of art and art history, of classical studies in which students can study Greek and Latin. They can also study archeology. span um, We have an English department. Um, we have a department of Latin American, Latino and Iberian studies, which is actually my home department known as La Lis. And here students study Spanish and um, all the, the different Spanish speaking countries and cultures, um, as well as Portuguese. Um, and through study abroad, we've even had students study Basque um, and Catalan as well. Um, and then we have the Department of Languages, Literatures and Cultures. And I have um, a whole list of languages um, that I'd like to mention that, that you can study here. Um, you can engage in Arabic studies, Chinese, French, German, Italian, Japanese, and Russian. Um, but we also have um, a self-directed language learning program for lesser taught languages. So it's also possible to study at U of R um, Korean or Swahili or Catalan, really any language that you can imagine you can, you can study um, at U of R. And something really distinctive about language study at U of R that I wanted to mention is that you can actually begin a language from scratch. You can study abroad and then you can become fluent um, that way. So you don't have to have had uh, any, any sort of language study um, in, in high school um, before coming here. You can actually start from zero and you can get very far because we have a lot of um, intensive uh, language learning that goes on here on campus. Um, in the arts, um, I already mentioned art and art history. Um, we also have music and we have theater and dance and we have, first class facilities in the arts, um, along with faculty who are engaged professionally in their respective fields. So we're, we're not a conservatory, but we like to think that we're kind of one step away from, from being a conservatory, but we, we have, uh, unlike a conservatory, we have the liberal arts um, um, program in which students can engage. Um, and so we also have two interdisciplinary programs in Division I. We have film studies, and we do have um, both a major and a minor in film studies. And we have linguistics as well. And linguistics is what we call an interdisciplinary program, which kind of draws from different departments around campus. And that's um, a very, very um, exciting, um, burgeoning um, program on campus. Um, and um, I would say that um, these are all uh, departments and, and majors and minors in which uh, students have the opportunity to um, enhance their creativity and also enhance their cultural awareness and their communication uh, skills. Um, you know, being bilingual, for example, or becoming multilingual is something that can open doors to various uh, career opportunities. Um, we kind of view language as being um, equivalent to culture, right? So for us, language is culture. If you're engaged in language study, you're engaged in the study of a culture along with literature, along with art. These are all disciplines that are easily combinable um, with other forms of study. So for instance, we've had students who have studied both um, physics, for example, and then they've done a, a double major with physics and dance, let's say, or physics and theater, if they're interested, let's say, in lighting design. That's an interesting um, combination. Andy, if you want to move to the next slide, um, I can talk a little bit about some of the possible career paths that we've seen um, in, with regard to students in Division I. So um, there are all kinds of job possibilities in the creative arts and economies. Um, you can you know, work um, in the performing arts, you can work in acting, you can work in music, 
as well. Um, you can work for a museum. Um, we have students who go on to study international relations and foreign diplomacy. Uh, we have students who become translators or interpreters. Um, students who go into education and research, some who have gone on to the Peace Corps, um, some students who become uh, lawyers. So I, I think that these are all uh, disciplines that are, as I said, easily um, combinable and that often enhance um, what you might be um, wanting to, to pursue in terms of a career. Um, and so I think that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Dr. Manuela Meyer um, in Division Two. So as I mentioned at the beginning, my name is Manuela Meyer, and I am the Associate Dean of the Humanities and Social Sciences in the School of Arts and Sciences. And I also teach in the Department of History and in the interdisciplinary programs of Global Studies as well as Africana Studies. So for today, I'd like to talk just a little bit about these terms. What exactly do they mean, the humanities and the social sciences, which may seem a bit alien, but I hope to within the brief time that we have to debunk them a bit and in doing so underscore their significance to a liberal arts education. I will also highlight the range of academic disciplines as well as programs in the division that is division two so as to plant seeds in your minds about what you may want to explore while at UR. So what exactly are the humanities? The humanities are academic disciplines that study human nature, or my favorite definition, the humanities are disciplines of memory and imagination, telling us where we have been and helping us envision where we are going. From an academic standpoint, the humanities include the study of history, philosophy, religious studies, journalism, and other fields. Humanities research adds to our knowledge of the world as scholars and students investigate differences between cultures and communities around the world and across time, and they consider the ways art is made and received or unveil the undercurrents that have shaped history. Humanities education encourages students to think creatively and critically, to reason and to ask questions. People from different walks of life across philosophical and political perspectives agree on the significance of the humanities. For example, former President Ronald Reagan believed that, quote, the arts and humanities teach us who we are and what we can be. They lie at the very core of the culture of which we are a part. So what exactly are the social sciences? So I have to admit, I have to be honest, full disclaimer, when I was a first year college student, my eyes literally glazed over whenever I heard the term social science, I had no idea what it meant. At least there was a human in the word humanities, but the social sciences, who, what, where, don't know it. So it is okay. So when we talk about the social sciences, we understand them as a branch of learning that examines society's institutions, their structures, their theoretical foundations, evolution, and interrelationships, and how they affect and are affected by human nature. So ultimately, social scientists, which can be political scientists, as well as geographers or education specialists, they study the how and why of what people do or should do. Customarily, these disciplines include sociology, education and political science, psychology, rhetoric and communication studies, as we see in this slide. Now, is there a hard division or separation between the humanities and the social sciences? No. The two branches of knowledge can often have critical areas of overlap as learners use the same theoretical and methodological tools to approach a critical topic, question, or issue. Now, as you can see, the School of Arts and Sciences provides a broad range of majors and offers numerous opportunities for both disciplinary, and that's what you see by departments listed, as well as interdisciplinary study in the humanities and the social sciences. And such study takes many forms, from self-designed programs to interdisciplinary concentrations within traditional fields to fully develop interdisciplinary majors. 
Students at UR can major, double major, minor in academic disciplines such as history, journalism, philosophy, political science, religious studies, etc. Now, when we look at the interdisciplinary programs, as we see them listed here, we are specifically referring to a method or a mindset that merges traditional education concepts or methods in order to arrive at new approaches or solutions. So ultimately, more than just pasting together traditional types of knowledge and subjects, when we talk about interdisciplinary programs, we're talking really about this integration of methods. We're actually encouraging students, as faculty members are also encouraging themselves, to think in a flexible manner in terms of stretching their intellectual horizons. Now, the School of Arts and Sciences offers support for interdisciplinary study through a number of programs, such as American Studies, Environmental Studies, Global Studies, PPEL, which stands for, again, as you see, Philosophy, Politics, <clears throat> Economics and Law, WGSS, Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and newly inaugurated this past fall of 2022, Africana Studies. Now, if this embarrassment of riches is still not enough, the school offers a self-designed interdisciplinary major. And this major provides students the opportunity to propose and to pursue with faculty supervision a unique program of study, leading either to a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science degree with a major in interdisciplinary studies. The one program that we have that only provides a minor is education. So irrespective of the potential majors and minors that one may explore and ultimately follow, it's important to note that a &S faculty is composed of excellent teachers and active scholars. The, the enthusiasm for mentoring undergraduates can be seen in the courses that we teach, as well, it, as well as in our own individual research initiatives. Now, it's also important to note that students have a variety of hands-on experiences through the International Study Center, the Bonner Center for Civic Engagement, and a variety of other programs that are within academic internships as well as mentoring initiatives. Ultimately, educational efforts are guided by the model, as Dean Kavanaugh noted, of liberal learning, where knowledge is used in the search where knowledge is used in the service of leading purposeful and critical lives and being good stewards of the communities in which one belongs. Now, one program that I'd like to highlight that actually bridges a variety of different disciplines and concepts is health studies. Health studies is a department that is vibrant and that is growing and it equips students with theoretical and empirical frameworks for understanding the social, cultural, and the environmental context that shape individual and population health. And this is a department that my colleague, Dr. <clears throat> Kellen Donald is going to speak about in a few minutes. But if I may have the next slide, Andy. Thank you. Before Dr. Donald talks about division three, I just like to highlight that within the humanities and social sciences, there are a variety of different paths that one can actually follow, such as public policy, government consulting, and the list goes on and on and on. One thing that I'd like to leave you with is the following though, that is, in this age where we think that artificial intelligence, as well as the sciences, no offense to my colleague, Dr. Hel um, uh, Dr. Helling, is, is that um, we have to think of, about the significance of the humanities and social sciences, given that they enrich our lives, similarly, similarly as the sciences do. Thank you. So I want to follow on from all of the very interesting information that you have heard already from, from my colleagues by talking to you about Division Three. As I mentioned, I'm a chemist and I teach in this division and I have special responsibilities in the Dean's office for the departments in this, in this division. And the 
In Division Three, the School of Arts and Sciences brings together curious students interested in the sciences and come and bring them in the same space with academic experts who are trained in cutting edge empirical approaches to investigating the natural world, as well as looking and working on developing modern analytical and technological tools and computational strategies as well for interrogating the the world for understanding for understanding the world in which we in which we in the physical world in which we live and also in the division we have psychology which is focused on exploring the the brain and and behavior so students in this division work with faculty to gaze at the world as it were to answer similar questions in some ways to those that have been discussed before but to take uh, an approach, to take a scientific approach that often asks or start, often starts with questions like how and what and why, and using the scientific method to try to answer those, those questions. And they do so not, the students do that in this division, not just from hearing or seeing, but also too by doing. And so you might notice that on this slide and also on the previous slide, we you see, you see students doing work themselves at the at the workbench in a laboratory environment. And that is not just for the two slides that you that you saw, but that is the general ethos of the approach that we take in the in the sciences for, for training students. And this is an ancient kind of approach to in the, in the sciences where um, somebody with experience takes on somebody else who is less experienced and help them to come up to speed with the knowledge of the, of the day. And we take that approach very seriously in the, in the sciences. And that goes across all of the departments that we have in this division. And those departments include biology as listed here on this slide, chemistry, computer science, mathematics and statistics, physics and, and psychology. And within these departments, there are certain specializations too to which you might gravitate. So for example, in biology, you might be interested in ecology or you might be interested in plants. So you might study botany, or you might be interested in microbiology. You might be interested in one of those one of those other kinds of approaches that are taken in in in, in biological biological studies. So, ranging from understanding the distribution of certain plants in the in the state of Virginia or in or in in your own states, or understanding the migration of ticks, for example, which is a big issue with the with climate change occurring so that you have a redistribution of where uh, ticks can thrive in the in the country. In chemistry, we have also various areas in which you can study. So we have organic and inorganic and and physical and physical chemistry. We in computer science continues to be a, an emerging and developing and developing area, and there are many exciting things happening there with artificial intelligence and human computer interaction in mathematics and statistics. One of the interesting things about the the mathematics department here is that there are many applied many faculty members who are doing work in applied mathematics. And so we see from time to time publications that come out that are, joint between mathematicians and biologists or ma mathematicians and geographers or mathematicians and other and people in other areas. Uh, we have, for example, a mathematics professor who has been with us for, for a year, who is trained as a political scientist as well. And so she has connections to data science also, which I will mention, will mention shortly. And the same thing too for physics and, and psychology. In physics, you have cosmology and you also have, have, intra, have areas that deal with, with um, using electron microscopes 
to study to study materials and and surfaces and and in psychology we have cognitive science and and neuroscience so so all of these general departments all of these departments have many aspects that will likely be of interest to you if you're thinking of being of being a scientist in we also have interdisciplinary programs, which have been explained generally already. These are programs that bring together various disciplines to try to answer interesting questions at the margins and of at, at the at the intersections of these uh, of of the of, of two or more disciplines. And so, biochemistry and molecular biology brings together chemistry and and biology. Data science brings together a host of other areas including mathematics and 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 many areas in the humanities where data are important and also in the in the in other disciplines in the sciences too like chemistry and and biology and then we have integrated and inclusive science which brings together the, the different sciences to try to address common and interesting interesting questions now that's all wonderful, but the question that comes to mind for you that um, that also has been addressed by by other associate deans is well, what can I do with that? And there are many things that you can do, and it does not only mean going to medical school or going to graduate school, even though those are great options. You can graduate from the university and go to graduate school in any of the areas we mentioned before. Or you can be a pre-med student while majoring in one of those areas and then leave to go to the medical school. But there are also students who have graduated in the sciences who are now working in research and innovation who are contributing to advancements in technology in various in various areas ranging from computer scientists who are working at, at at Google and Apple and so on or people who are creating startups by finding innovative new technological ideas there is patent law as well which also benefits from a knowledge of the of the sciences data science and statistics which is a massive and continue and also continuously growing area that has applications everywhere and then in industry there are many places where you can where you can go i have a research student who is into cosmetics and who is doing a masters now in 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 the in that area in 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 europe and so that's one place you can go, go. agrochemicals are important for all the farming that takes place in the country and of course, coming out of COVID, we understand the value of the pharmaceutical industry. And then there is, of course, too, science journalism, which also, too, is an, a, an experience, which also, too, we appreciate the value of from our experience with COVID, that we need people who are able to talk to us about science in a language that is not bound up in the jargon of the discipline, but that is accessible to the to the wider public. And then healthcare as well. And uh, Professor Meyer mentioned the link between health studies and health professions. And that link is, is very strong. It's important to have scientists who understand healthcare, but also people on the policy side who understand the implications for, for living and society. And then we have engineers, we have laboratory technicians, Actuarial science is important, and that is how your, your insurance people determine how much they will charge for insurance products. Uh, social sciences also overlap in many ways with the, with, the, um, with the sciences. And then there are many people in public service who are scientists. We need scientists to make decisions about the scientific direction of the, of the country. And so there are many, many politicians are lawyers, that is true, but there are also some um, like Margaret Thatcher who can get degrees in PhDs in, um, in chemistry um, or Angela Merkel, for example, who is a, a physicist. And so there's a lively place for you in politics if you are interested um, in being a scientist as well. And of course, consulting is one of those general areas in which people can go. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Dr. Donald. So 
I just like to touch upon some of the words that Dr. Donald left us with, and that's charting your intellectual or your academic path at UR, whatever it may be. Given that we have spoken a lot, and it may seem to you as if we're coming at a rapid pace about a lot of departments, a lot of majors, a lot of minors, and concentrations to study at the University of Richmond. Ultimately, we are confident that you will find an academic area or areas rather sometimes to challenge and to help you grow. Ultimately, I think that the first year should be about exploring academic and intellectual options, taking courses that interest you and beginning with trying to get the intellectual feet a little bit wet. Ultimately, we know that at the University of Richmond, you will not declare a major until your sophomore or your second year. So there is no pressure to ultimately decide what you ultimately want to major or minor in. And the major and minoring process is fairly simple, given that to declare a major or minor in the School of Arts and Sciences, all you have to do is complete the major and minor declaration form, which is available online through the registrar's office. And students can change their majors or minors after they have declared them. Given that at the University of Richmond, we have a lot of students that are actually double majors, it's important to just talk a little bit about this process. Given that when a student declares a double major, they choose one major as their primary major and their advisor is assigned from that department by the department chair. And this is the advisor that they must meet with before registration. And this is the advisor marking them for, for the banner web system, which is an electronic system that you that you will become all too familiar with when you are on campus as advised. Now, it's important to note that double majors then can are free to meet unofficially with their secondary advisors to make sure that they stay on track with that second major. It's just important to note that the secondary advisor isn't recorded in the banner web electronic system and cannot mark a student as advised. So then students often have to make these advising connections on their own. But that said, though, again, the declaration of the major and minor is in the offing. So as incoming first years, what do we need to know? We need to know about this fantastic, incredible resource called the Academic Advising Resource Center that is led by Dr. Nicole Morantonio, and she is the director for advising first year seminar and first and second year programming, as well as the assistant director, Andrea Vest. Given that, as incoming first years, all new spiders are assigned a peer academic advisor, otherwise known as a PA, and PAs are well-trained student staff members of the Academic Advising Resource Center who will be in contact with you via email and phone, if they haven't been already, throughout the summer. You can expect to hear from them already if not by the end of this month. So be sure to check your Richmond email for important messages from them. And in addition to working with this peer academic advisor, you will also receive help from a dedicated faculty or staff academic advisor. And this summer advisor will reach out to you in July to help finalize your fall course choices and answer any questions that you may have. And if you still have questions or concerns, you are more than free to contact, again, the Academic Advising Resource Center or professors of courses that you are interested in. And of course, us as associate deans and deans of the School of Arts and Sciences. Ultimately, again, I just want to encourage you to fully explore the opportunities that will be available to you once you are formally on campus. So I think at this juncture, I'd like to transfer the conversation to Dr. Donald so that he can talk about the, the culmination of all the hard work that many of our students do past the first year experience as it relates to the a &S Honors Convocation and Student Symposium Program. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mayer. So I want to tell you a little bit quickly about the 
the Arts and Sciences Honors Convocation and the Student Symposium. Many students, while they're here, do undergraduate research with professors across the School of Arts and Sciences. And the culminating event each year for that experience is to share the work that, that you have done with, peer, with, your, with, with your peers and with other professors at a symposium that's held that's held um, usually near the end of the end of April. Now, the university, as you may as you may know, offers the Richmond Guarantee, which is an opportunity for students to do research, to do to have an undergraduate experience um, outside of the classroom for uh, at least one summer. And many students use the Richmond Guarantee to do undergraduate undergraduate research, and so that is how some of this undergraduate research is funded by the university for students to spend a summer on campus. But many students spend more than one summers on campus doing undergraduate research. And so that is definitely very possible, very possible here. And the symposium provides a chance for you to share some of that work. And so here we see just one example on the right of a student talking to other students, I think mostly, about research that she has done during her time on campus. And this may have been during the summer or it may have been during the academic year as well, which is also a lively time for research to be done. And some of this work will, some of the work that's shared at the symposium in April will eventually be published in, in internationally respected academic journals. Some of it will make it into honored theses and so on, but all of it, will help the students to go deeper in the discipline than they would just by um, just by going just by having regular regular classes. The Arts and Sciences Con Honors Convocation is an opportunity to celebrate academic accomplishment at the end of the year as well. And so we, we recognize students who have who have won awards of various sorts based on their their academic work. We have some special awards that are given to students based on their, their, their papers that they have written and also based on artistic work and based on other accomplishments too that we, that we acknowledge at the symposium. There is one picture here at the end of our last honors convocation with some of the students who have received awards for various uh, academic, academic efforts. And so, these two culminating activities, I, I know you will enjoy it once you have had a, a chance to be on campus and have and have begun to have all the accomplishments that I'm sure you will you will have while you're here. So um, I I guess I'm going to um, conclude, um, but I wanted to underscore the synergies that exist between divisions and disciplines in the School of Arts and Sciences. And here um, we have a sample of just some of the symposium presentations that are truly emblematic of this, this synergy. Um, I would say one of the hallmarks of our curriculum within the School of Arts and Sciences is our interdisciplinarity, our interdisciplinary connections, and the various opportunities available to our students to, to harness right all of these interesting possibilities that come from these synergies. So for example, um, we had a presentation titled A Sense of Place, which was a short film about the pandemic experience from a student in film studies, but the student was using their knowledge of science and, um, and health and health studies um, to create a presentation um, and, a, and a whole full-fledged project. We also had a presentation titled Parallels Between Mussolini's Fascism and the Populism of Salvini. This was from a student in Italian studies, but clearly it's a presentation that shows uh, an intersection uh, between Italian studies and political science. 
Um, another example is Ecuador's bumpy road to modernity. So this um, was a student who had an interest in the Hispanic world, um, perhaps a student who had studied in Lalis, um, but also was majoring in journalism. Um, and then we have um, the cost to our communities and environmental justice analysis of the development of the Mountain Valley Pipeline. And this was a student um, ostensibly in geography but who was able to bring to bear their knowledge of environmental studies, right, and environmental justice. Um, and then we have the effects of demolition projects on rat activity in urban areas. You may have heard of the famous rats in the psychology lab um, at the University of Richmond. So this is a student who was able to bring to bear their, their knowledge of, of biology and then perhaps um, knowledge as well um, of, of, of urban planning and of, of politics. Um, and then we have finally um, a presentation titled Modeling Kidney Function um, by a student in mathematics who clearly was bringing um, also in, into the project their knowledge of um, health studies, right? And of um, um, biology perhaps and, and medicine. So um, this is just an example of the possibilities um, that uh, really come to fruition um, and, and, and in this culminating activity that is our uh, student symposium each year. So well, I'll hand I wanna, it off to Jenny. I want to thank uh, all the associate deans for uh, sharing their knowledge of their divisions. And I, I imagine you can tell what a rich buffet uh, the School of Arts and Sciences is for you to explore. Um, and you know, I, I know it's very natural for us to focus on majors and career options, but just want to emphasize that a liberal arts education is also a place where you can learn to think about how to have a meaningful, purposeful life, uh, to think about what it means to be uh, a citizen, what it means to be a lifelong learner, um, to ask big questions and to think creatively. So we are so excited to have you join us. Um, and I think what I'll do now is uh, turn it over to Andy, who um, can take questions and we'll answer as best we can. So thank you. Andy, I think you're still muted a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> You'd think after this many years. <laughs> um, so if, you have, if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to use the Q&A function located at the bottom of the screen, and we're happy to answer any questions you have. So the first question that popped in there was, does every student participate in the symposium? I'll just let anybody answer that. Yeah, so uh, not every student participates in the participate in each symposium, but uh, large, but the the majority of the students in arts and sciences over their four years here will be in, involved in the symposium. So some students may do research for a year. Some students may do research for all for almost all four years while they are here. And they would present at the symposium during, during, during that during that time. So um, the vast majority of the students in the in the school will contribute. In any given in any given year, the symposium, the symposium may may host up to up to two hundred students who are presenting, and some uh, posters that is, and those posters may have more than one student on the, on them. So, so there's a lot of lot of um, work that's that's going on. And in addition to the posters, students also present their artwork in a in a in a forum nearby. And some students also elect to give oral presentations, which are sometimes also done in pairs. For example, if you have two students working on a single project, they might tag team on the oral presentation. 
I'll, I'll add that it, it also varies from department to department because some departments, for example, might have a senior capstone project that students are required to present as part of the symposium or students who receive uh, summer research funding, for example, um, are required to present the fruits of their of their research at the symposium. So like as my colleague, um, Professor Donald mentioned, um, every student will probably present at least once something at the symposium during their four years at U of R. So the next question I think is a common question that I hear from new students and parents about law school, right? Which has a lot of ways to enter a law school um, in thinking about majors and disciplines and all of those things. So what is your advice about um, an entering first year student with the attention, with the current intention of attending law school to approach their first year without committing at least unofficially to a particular field of study? If I may, I think that's a great question. And I would say to be wide and explore as many different courses to have as much breadth as you can. That said, if if law school is something that is in the back of your mind that is still intruding on your other thoughts, I would offer the following advice. That is one, probably set up a meeting, maybe during your first semester with the pre-law advisor. And that is Dr. Jan French. And she is an associate professor of anthropology. So you may want to send her it her an email, again, that's Dr. Jan French, to have a conversation, an informal conversation about law school possibly. And my second piece of advice would be to, again, send an email and faculty members, as you will find at the University of Richmond, are very generous with their time and they're more than happy to meet and to discuss with students passions that are very dear to them. So, I would also then advise that you email Dr. Yepi von Platz, and he is the coordinator of the Philosophy, Politics, Economics, and Law program, which is a thriving and burgeoning interdisciplinary program that many of our students are interested in. So again, this is the Philosophy, Politics, Economics, and Law program, otherwise known as PPEL. So I would recommend, again, first and foremost, be wide and expansive. And then if law is still something that is very dear and close to your heart, to possibly reach out to those two faculty members to have some beginning conversations with them about law school, courses of study, classes, extracurricular activities, paracurricular activities that may be of interest to you. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. I totally agree. Uh, and actually, you all have a fantastic website in the School of Arts and Sciences on pre-law. It's just prelaw.richmond.edu, and it gives great advice. And there's actually a pre-law listserv that I had no idea that existed, which is great that you can that students can sign up for. And I know it's very active with information and resources and all of that too. So thank you. Um, I have a question for you about. Um, uh, classes and what they can fulfill. So if can students take one class to fulfill a credit in two different majors? For instance, would a math credit for biology fill a math credit for environmental science? Or is it that you have to take two classes? So the idea of kind of double dip a class to count for two things. Sure. Kelly, did you want to yeah. take it? Or did... uh, yes. So, so yeah. So there are a number of courses that can count for for different for different requirements. There may be special cases where, for example, if you are doing two courses that are very close together, like uh, chemistry and biochemistry or biology and biochemistry, there might be stipulations that you have to do two separate courses to fulfill two related related requirements. But in general, there are overlaps that uh, where you, such that you can take a single course that fulfills more than one requirement. Great. 
And then we have one more question that I'm happy to answer and actually put a link in the chat for, which is what tools do students recommend to obtain before they come to U of R? Any recommended laptop or software? And so our, IS, our information services department has a great um, link uh, and a great article that we send to students all the time. The choice is really yours, but we also know that the it can be really intimidating or confusing to buy a new laptop or computer. And so this is some advice that they have. The choice is really yours. Um, there's also, um, uh, it has, you know, so on that, there's some hardware specifications as well as some software specifications. Um, there's options at the university for students to purchase um, at a very big discount, um, Microsoft Office 365, so that you can get that. And that is also linked on that article as well. Um, I don't know if the faculty have any other advice about laptops or computers that they want to give, but that's sort of our information services has done a great job of, of sent, putting together some information for folks. I would just add that um, I think a lot of faculty do have a preference for the Microsoft suite. Um, and I know that a lot of students coming out of high school are used to using Google Docs, let's say, for everything. And I think um, when they you know, arrive in their first year seminars, they find out, oh, they need to be writing and using perhaps a different um, uh, word processing program, so to speak, right? And so um, it's it's really good to um, avail oneself of um, the discount that's available to students for um, the Microsoft suite, um, or what is it called? Microsoft 360 mm -hmm. that you mentioned, right? Um, I think that a lot of faculty kind of have a preference for that. Right. Yeah, otherwise, if there are specialized programs that you will need for a particular project or for research, then those are usually available in yeah. your in your lab or for the particular course that you are that you are taking. So you would not be required to get that separately. So a, a program, for example, like Mathematica, or 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 a, some specially specialized software would be made available available to you through the course. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that in, in the arts, for example, there is a lot of specialized software as well, and we make that available to our students. So when it's necessary, we we have a license whereby we can provide it um, for students in the in a specific class. So there's no need to make these large purchases of very specific software, depending on the discipline. So we have one more question in the chat, and I think we'll probably wrap it up there, which is, are there credit hour requirements different for those who double major? So if I may, so those that double major, the credit apps, the credit hour requirements are not different if you are getting a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Science, or a Business Administration. So all of those students must complete 35 units to graduate. So that said though, different majors may have different unit requirements so that one has to investigate how many units is required to fulfill a given major. But again, ultimately, those that are seeking to get a Bachelor of Arts, a BA, a Bachelor of Science, BS, or business administration, they must complete 35 units. Now, those seeking the dual degree that is BA or BS, they must complete 44 academic units, but that's only the dual degree if you're doing both. <laughs> and, and I'll add just to give an example, um, if, if a student, because there was a question earlier about so-called double dipping, if a student were to have um, a double major, let's say in Latin American, Latino and Iberian studies, and then global studies, chances are there would be some courses that would count for both majors, right? Or if you were to have, let's say film studies, a film studies major along with French, uh, French studies, you might have some courses that overlap there. So I hope that answers the question as well. I would just clarify, um, as Dr. Meyer said, a a dual a double major is one degree, one college degree uh, with two, but you had two majors. Um, but a dual degree means you are graduating with two college degrees, um, and that's why there's extra uh, extra credits required for that. But it's very not that many people do that. Most students double major. <laughs> Most students yeah. don't. And not du dual degree. <laughs> <laughs> Many double major. Not Correct. Many. Yeah. 
Well, I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming in on a Tuesday night and speaking with our new students and parents. Uh, thanks everyone who is in attendance. This will get uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if there's something that you want to come back to, otherwise feel free to reach out to us at newspiders at richmond.edu and we're happy to answer any questions that you have along the way. Thanks for joining us tonight. Bye everyone. Thank you. All the best.